Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Home stretch, right? Two more sessions, uh, as expected. Uh, a full house, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, so it's always a challenge with these last two sessions, right? So in terms of attendance, so thank you for being here. Uh, and uh, in terms of the overall flow for the session itself, this is uh, supposed to be a thought leadership se session. So if I do the job right, there should be a lot of information that is aligned with the type of activities you all are adopting within your own enterprises. And hopefully there are a few items that you can take away that are, uh, that are progressive or a little bit different from your approaches, et cetera. So in terms of introduction, uh, I am uh, the Senior Vice President for IT here at CA Technologies. Uh, as part of my charter, I have responsibility for the cybersecurity function. And with that comes, with, comes the responsibility of uh, staying awake at night, wondering where the insider threat is coming from and how do you address the, the, the challenges. In terms of the, the agenda, when we talk about an insider, there are slightly varied definitions, views, et cetera. So I'll go about defining how we see, the ins, ins, uh, how we see an insider. Hopefully it's aligned with uh, how all of us see an insider. I'll talk about the different threat actors, motivations, and attack targets, because the logic around that is, if you understand the threat actors, the motivators, and attack targets, you're able to create strategies and, and plans that are going to thwart those approaches. And then I'll talk about the attack techniques, you know, everything from simply people trying to check out how far they can go with, with respect to accessing files to something more if malicious. I'll talk about uh, detect and protect, right? So uh, from our, our point of view, uh, if you think about it, we believe a strong defense is uh, necessarily uh, a good offense also. So definitely in terms of progress, there is more investments around the protect aspects well, because with Detect, there's uh, definitely a lot of uh, analytics that has to, be, uh, has to be run, and that, that area is still evolving and growing, so uh, we'll talk a little, bit more, a little bit about that. And then the response and recovery. So should you have an event happen, what are some of the strategies and plans? Because while it's always good to have an approach to uh, protect and detect, you also want to be able to respond and recover should something anomalous happen. And then I'll talk about what we think are the core components in terms of uh, the ingredients for success. Uh, it should be aligned with uh, a lot of the things that are probably in place within your teams and your organizations. So let's define an insider. So in terms of a definition, an actor who has a legitimate identity and is using it for illegitimate or illicit purposes. So that can fall under three categories. Uh, uh, an employee, somebody who is operating as a contractor within the organization, and then the third profile is a partner or vendor who has connectivity to data and information that is within your applications, within your network. So that's how uh, we define an, uh, uh, define an insider. Just a quick show of hands, uh, people who are in agreement with this is the, uh, an insider quick. Most of us are on the same page. Okay, good. So, so uh, that's uh, really how we are uh, looking at it. And then uh, fundamentally, all of these threat actors also have an identity. And so all the components we drive in terms of how they're using these identities to drive activities is really going to be the uh, follow-on uh, discussion. So let's talk about... Yeah, the question was, uh, do you consider customers as uh, inside a threat? We don't. Uh, you know, we consider them potentially as an external threat because that identity it can be used by as, as malicious purposes. Uh, so so that's, that's how we, we are categorizing it, okay? Uh, so the threat scenarios and motivators. The motivators are the ones that have the light blue background and uh, the threat scenarios uh, don't have that. So obviously a disgruntled employee, somebody who is uh, upset about something that's going on within the enterprise, uh, and, and uh, an employee who uh, 
is getting ready to leave the company. You know, we've had multiple use cases where somebody was leaving a company to go join a, another competitor or something like that, and, and in the last one or two weeks, they're downloading a lot of intellectual property information, et cetera. So that's, uh, that's a situation and a scenario. Uh, somebody uh, who really is doing something uh, from an espionage activity, right? So everybody's well aware of the Sony Pictures uh, hack and, and what happened there. Uh, while there's a lot of speculation that, you know, was that nation state led, China, et cetera, the belief is it was somebody on the inside working with somebody on the outside. So that's a real threat scenario where, and probably the most deadly and most difficult because uh, those are very well structured, well organized, uh, low and slow attacks. And so that's, uh, that's another scenario. And um, the, uh, the curiosity led um, employee, somebody who just wants to see how far they can go. Can they go ahead and gain access to a certain share or a file and see, uh, can they look at uh, some kind of HR information? Can they look at uh, employee salaries? Uh, you know, so you have those types of uh, insider threats, uh, threats also. And then uh, finally, the accidental threat. An employee who sends uh, some kind of uh, confidential information to another employee within the company or somewhere outside. Uh, so data loss prevention you know, uh, type of uh, scenarios. And then somebody using that information on a malicious, uh, uh, from a malicious standpoint and doing something, uh, something with it. And then in terms of uh, motivators, money. You know, money is definitely uh, a big motivator. At CA for us, uh, probably compared to like a financial services organization, it's a little less of a threat uh, if you were in the financial services industry then an insider could actually move funds from one account to another, so that would be a realistic scenario. Uh, then uh, the obvious ego, you know, everybody wants to believe that they can get into uh, the, the typical hacker who wants to get into some kind of information or not. So what kind of threat scenarios that come up uh, around that, uh, that con context? And somebody who really wants to drive some malicious destruction of data, take down systems, availability, just because they don't like something about the company or they don't like something about their team, their boss, whatever it may be. So those are all the, all the motivators. And as we think about our insider threat strategy and plan, these are the types of context we apply so that in developing a plan and a strategy, we're able to come up with an approach that makes sense for us. So uh, that's the context around that. Attack targets. What you see on the left side of the screen are how at CA we categorize our crown jewels. So the crown jewels uh, fall under five categories for us, credit card data, intellectual property, source code, uh, personal, 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 I, personally identifiable information, and customer data. So those are the crown jewels as we categorize them. So we are constantly trying to discover them and drive the right level of ring fencing around these data and look at different patterns, et cetera, to be able to understand how we are adopting the right protect and de detect solutions to uh, protect our systems. System availability, right? So system availability and money are two of the other uh, attack targets also. So when you look at it, somebody wants to basically put a logic bomb, you know, where they, uh, after, after they leave the company, et cetera, something goes off and the system goes down and nobody knows you know, what has happened, et cetera, and you have massive outages and, and issues, et cetera. And then obviously we spoke about the monetary angle where somebody is trying to uh, exfiltrate or move uh, funds from one account to another. So uh, what, are, what are some of the attack techniques? So when we look at the uh, attack techniques, self-credentials. Self-credentials are whatever you have as uh, your rights within the environment, within the system, right? So there are individuals who go about and say, okay, let me just go ahead and browse around. Let me try to connect to this server. Let me connect to that share. Let's see how far we can take this, uh, this picture and see how far I can get in, try, in, in terms of trying to uh, identify information repositories that can be used for some kind of a benefit or for malicious purposes. Corporate search, believe it or not, you know, uh, you can go probably to most organizations and type employee salary, and you may be surprised that you end up with a, 
you know, accessing a share where somebody in HR has saved a file that has uh, salary information of uh, your own department, for example, right? So those are situations and, situations and uh, scenarios that actually crop up. I've seen that. I'm sure some of you have probably seen those things happen where information that should not be on certain shares, uh, you know, were there. So using self-credentials, you'll have individuals who are just snooping around, just looking at different shares, trying to see this file looks interesting, let me open the file, see what's in there. And if the file is password protected, then they go ahead and try to do a brute force attack to see if they can uh, get that password broken and, and be able to gain access to that information. Uh, file systems and uh, shares, you know, uh, where people put information where they should not be putting them, right? So, and this includes like FTP, uh, FTP sources, et cetera, uh, where information should not be saved. So these are, uh, these are locations where you see these threat actors going and looking for uh, certain things to see if they can get some information around it. And then uh, tied to that are the co uh, common stores. Over-provisioned access. Over-provisioned access typically comes about when an employee moves from one department to another. Uh, if, if, the, if you don't have the right processes and approaches to be able to revoke their, uh, uh, you know, revoke their rights from the old environment. So let's assume somebody moves on a job rotation from HR to, uh, to product development or finance or another location. So let's assume they're given some rights and uh, when they move to that rotation and when they come back, those rights are not revoked then you know, they end up having access to information that really they shouldn't have, and that becomes a challenge in terms of how, uh, how you're protecting the overall uh, crown jewels of your environment. So protect and de detect approaches. So from, from our point of view, when we talk about protect and detect, uh, we believe, like I said uh, earlier, a strong defense is uh, absolutely necessary, and today, Predominantly, our investments are around protect. And we are continuing to grow the detect uh, capabilities uh, where we can actually leverage analytics to be able to look at patterns, et cetera. I'm sure if you walked around, there are some new solutions that even CA is looking at from threat analytics that uh, you can, uh, you can uh, begin using. Uh, privileged access management. You know, typically, that is one identity that is always in the kill chain where somebody is accessing somebody's privileged access and then using that for malicious purposes. So uh, having a strong privileged access management strategy is core to having a good defense. And all you, what you see there where it says spam plus jump hosts plus MFA, that's privileged access management combined with using jump hosts combined with multi-factor authentication. So all of our privileged access management uh, uh, capabilities are, uh, we use jump hosts and we are continuing to push that out and also use multi-factor authentication so these environments can be protected more effectively. Uh, shared accounts, not having shared accounts is a, is a you know, or, or reducing the number of shared accounts and making sure you have the right analytics to ensure activity around shared accounts are monitored and managed and effectively, uh, effectively uh, supported is, is something that's important. Uh, DLP or data loss prevention, right? So that is basic and basic um, foundational component in most organizations, being able to ensure that uh, uh, there's no accidental exfiltration of data or movement of data from one employee to another accidentally or intentionally. So that's a, that's a core uh, approach and plan in terms of how we look at uh, inside a threat. Access management, access control. I don't have to talk about it. I think uh, least privilege is something that's, uh, that's important. Uh, the other uh, approach we are beginning to adopt is uh, excessive notification. And when, I, when we talk about excessive notification, when there is some kind of uh, threat activity, making sure the, the individual who's, having ac who's making that access is notified that they have gone into a location where they should not have been and notifying their manager. That's a big deterrent of inside a threat in terms of being able, to, this is very similar to uh, when you change your password, let's say to your bank account, you get an email basically saying your password was changed, right? So you know that there is a level of protection, taking that logic and applying it to inside a threats 
uh, what it does is it, det it deters individuals when they go looking into places where they should not be that they are being observed. So that, you know, making that part and parcel of how uh, you're notifying and informing uh, the employee as well as their management uh, is a good, a good approach to deterring people from uh, snooping around and being in, in locations where they shouldn't be. Uh, logic bomb mi mining. So this goes back to the scenario where you have either a disgruntled employee or you have an employee who is getting ready to leave. So this comes down to building out a clear plan and strategy, working with the HR department to be able to understand what circumstances uh, uh, this employee left under and then going back and touching all, because we are a big software, we are a software company, we have a large number of developers and uh, we work closely with our product development teams to, uh, to ensure that we can scan the data repositories as well as the, the code sets that these employees were working on if they left under uh, not ideal terms. So making sure logic bomb mi mining is, in a pro, is, a, is a practice and then um, uh, making sure you have the right legal recourse, you know, making sure you have the right, uh, uh, right um, contracts, data classification, employee, um, uh, what do you call it? employee contracts, or I, I should say um, uh, paperwork when an employee joins in terms of how they can be, uh, what, what they can have access to, what they cannot have access to, and having the right uh, legal recourse around that. And then, uh, you know, watch lists. So, uh, all, Every company has situations where an employee is uh, either disgruntled or uh, in, a, in, a, in a position where they potentially could have access or do something malicious. So working closely with HR, closing, working closely with legal and having processes that would allow you to be able to have enhanced monitoring of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, these, uh, these employees is uh, another strategy. So in terms of detect, so in, in terms of detect, our view is the threat analytics space is continuing to evolve. So you see security, user behavior analytics. Some of the approaches we are adopting is to actually go ahead and use data science to drive some security analytics. So uh, the, the approach we are currently adopting is to predominantly build out most of our logic uh, using AWS solutions. Uh, when I talk about AWS solution, solutions, there's Redshift, there's EMR, EMR um, uh, which, is, which is the MapReduce uh, aspect or Hadoop uh, aspect of uh, AWS and Kinesis. So bringing the data science aspects to be able to understand the various algorithms that have to be used to drive uh, the identification of uh, insider threats and create patterns it's something that we're beginning to start working on. We are co uh, continuing to work closely with our product teams as well, because all of these strategies and uh, data science approaches are also being embedded into our products. Uh, so that's uh, evolving pace, and I think in about a year or two that'll become much more mainstream, uh, because uh, using big data analytics and using a lot of log information from various resource and resources and actually doing some strong pattern matching is going to become a little bit more mainstream. But today, uh, trying to uh, hire a data scientist for your security team, it's, it's frankly tough. You know, and believe it or not, we're trying. You know, we're trying to get a data scientist who can do analytics around uh, security, who can do analytics around operations intelligence, but that's still an evolving, uh, evolving field. Uh, good, the good news for us as CA, we have data scientists who are working on actually building out um, the, the models for our products. So we are trying to partner up with them and, and do the right things in terms of coming up with the right data science uh, algorithms and the data science approaches in terms of how we can uh, uh, mine the information for patterns. And uh, so when we're talking about these patterns, what, where, do we, where do we look for these logs? So the single sign-on logs, active directory logs, uh, risk, risk authentication logs, uh, server logs, and, and access review logs. These are the, the, the repositories. In addition to this, we also look at DNS uh, to, uh, to see patterns in terms of if, an, if a, a threat actor is uh, moving laterally, et cetera, from one application to another application if there's a certain pattern. And all of us have patterns. When we come into work, we log on, we go to a certain application, take care of certain things, 
Uh, and you have a profile depending on if you're an executive or a developer or a, or a finance person, salesperson, et cetera, being able to come up with the right profiles. Frankly, that's really the toughest challenge, in my opinion, from a data science perspective because, uh, you know, believe it or not, we've done a little bit of research. There are so many different algorithms and techniques, things like inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, abductive reasoning, Bayesian reasoning. So all these models are getting to a place where you can get some analytics. However, the challenge there is still a problem of a lot of false, false positives and false negatives, right? So that's the area where uh, a level of maturity has to, uh, has to evolve, and so we are continuing to make the investments. And, and um, our recommendation, start small. You know, you can start these, uh, these use cases using AWS as your, or you know, choose another cloud service that has uh, uh, big data analytics capabilities. Uh, you can uh, also Splunk and Sumo Logic or other two, two other platforms that are being used for uh, analysis, right? And then uh, the difference between using rules engines versus analytics. Rules engines are typically, they look at, uh, a certain type of activity and they apply a rule on it and then they come up with a conclusion. An analytics engine has three typical modes. It looks at it from a retrospe uh, retrospect perspective, looking back, the here and now, and then a predictive uh, context. So what we are, uh, try what we are, where we are at is more a ret retrospective view versus a predictive view. I think that's a maturity that will continue to evolve. Uh, I'd love to get to uh, near time or real time views into inside of threat pa patterns and profiles, but that's still an evolving, uh, evolving landscape. And I think in the next uh, year or two, that'll get much more mature and we'll be able to construct strong patterns. Obviously, this is a lot of data. Uh, the good news, you know, with big data and the cloud, you're able to pump this information into uh, giant structured, unstructured, or streaming databases, and, and you're able to come up with the right uh, analysis and patterns, right? And uh, so what, what type of activity alerts we look for? We look for uh, a spike in author authorization activity. So when you look at single sign-on logs or when you look at uh, uh, identity minor logs, uh, if you see a privileged access uh, user suddenly having a, a, a natural spike in activity, then that's something you want to flag and pay attention to. Uh, lat lateral movement. Lateral movement is typically somebody accesses a certain application or a certain server on a day in and day out basis. All of a sudden they start accessing different applications, different servers, etc. That's something you want to flag. And our opinion, start with the privileged access users. You know, it's going to be really difficult to try and get your enti entire enterprise uh, under um, pattern matching and being able to do log analysis. So starting with the privileged access users, doing security user behavior analytics, and then growing from there to power users, and then from there coming up with a, pers uh, a persona-based uh, uh, profile, and then building the analytics. That's the approach we are taking, and hopefully that's, uh, that makes uh, you know, uh, logical sense for everybody as well. And then any access anomalies. Access anomalies would be uh, somebody trying to access a uh, a financial database when they don't have access and have multiple failures. So, you know, being able to notify on those types of uh, activities, that's something uh, that we monitor and we try to uh, uh, take action upon. Um, so, what are some of the challenges, you know, to address in the environment, right? So, uh, if you have a lot of legacy apps, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to be able to have a good solid inside a threat uh, strategy and plan. And the reason behind this is because legacy apps typically don't have strong logging, you know, and, and legacy apps, if you turn on logging, performance goes down, has issues, et cetera, so this will be an impediment. Uh, in, inadequate log retention, you know, you, in, the, in the analytics world, you cannot have enough information, right? So if, you're, if you have logs for only a day, a week, et cetera, you may need more for retrospective analytics. So not having enough log retention is one of the challenges. Uh, application complexity. If you have applications that uh, are built uh, using you know, legacy approaches and techniques, then your, the ability to be able to understand movement within the applications is going to be challenging. So that's something you should look at from an overall context perspective in terms of how you can build out your insider threat uh, 
uh, strategy. And then if you have too many authorization engines, you know, uh, so if you don't have a, a, a good single sign-on solution or if you have too many uh, authorization engines across the enterprise, being able to correlate all those logs and trying to come up with something reasonable, very difficult. So, you know, consolidating authorization engines uh, is a good practice in terms of having a good uh, inside a threat strategy. And then uh, finally, you know, this is uh, obviously, uh, you know, we are CA, so these are all solutions that we have embraced. And if you look at, look at the solution list, a lot of it is around protect. Uh, you know, and there is some detect the threat analytics for privileged access management using risk, authentic risk authentication. So, and using those analytics definitely, you know, enhances the, uh, the detect capabilities. But uh, privileged access management, identity management, making sure people don't have excessive rights, uh, making sure I, uh, rights are revoked when people move between uh, departments, groups, et cetera. The foundational things, right, the, that we talk about day in and day out around uh, identity and access management. That's, uh, make that solid, and then from there, evolve to having strong analytics and growing from there. So, uh, just in terms of uh, an overall summary, uh, for, I, I'd say identify your crown jewels, know what you're protecting. This way you can drive the analytics around that. Then it comes down to having a strong identity and access management excellence. A privileged access management is really part of it. Uh, user behavior analytics, this is still an evolving, evolving landscape. Uh, so our recommendation, start small. Start with Active Directory, single sign-on, identity minder uh, type of logs. Uh, DNS is, is critical. Um, and using anything uh, that is uh, built into NetFlow would be another area to start small, look at certain patterns, and then growing from there. Uh, developing a security culture, right? I think that's a mindset, making sure all the organizations, the technical organizations within your team understand the analytics behind, uh, uh, behind the, the security landscape, uh, building innovative ways in terms of how, do you, how you thwart these challenges. That's another, another strong approach. And more importantly, have a strong cyber disaster plan and a malicious, malicious destruction of data prevention plan. So we actually go through and uh, ha you know, have a solution and a plan that will, uh, that will protect us if uh, we had somebody who was an insider who was coerced or was just malicious and started uh, deleting a bunch of data, et cetera. So having a good plan and testing, testing all of those aspects is another important detail in terms of how you come up with a strong insider threat plan. So that's really what I wanted to share. We have about three or four minutes. Love to take some questions. Go ahead, Naresh. You know, how, how are you reconciling some of the, you know, obviously CA has got a lot of security technology. You've implemented tons of it. Where are you sort of in the upgrade process of adopting the most recent things? And, you know, how, what, what's the oldest, you know, help us understand how you've kind of kept up with the roadmap. Yeah, uh, so, so a couple of things. Um, we try to stay on the latest releases. So that's a core focus for us. As CA, uh, you know, we are also testing out the products from a, uh, and working with our product development teams to identify any bugs and issues before our customers feel it. So we are typically on the cutting edge, sometimes bleeding edge. Into, you know, we have some problems when, when we're actually implementing beta products in production. Uh, so we are absolutely on the, uh, on the leading edge in terms of um, uh, implementing these solutions. So, so the offer is, uh, if anybody is interested in, uh, in a follow-on discussion, uh, my um, email address is mahendra.durai at ca.com. Please shoot me an email and we'll be, able, we'll be more than glad to share any of our learnings, any of our implementations, et cetera, so that we can uh, share, share ideas and help each other out. So that's uh, something I want to put on the table as well. All right, thank you very much, appreciate it.